Hello, I'm Phil Pan Baker with the Komodo Group, and this is part two of my proposal to make internet email secure. In part one, I looked at the motivations behind the proposal and the tools that we're going to be using. But one of the motives that is really important is the commercial motive. Why is that important? Because, well, if you want to have a, an infrastructure that's going to cost tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to deploy, you need to be providing a real economic benefit. Securing the web gave us internet commerce. Without the web, there couldn't have been Amazon, there couldn't have been eBay, there couldn't have been all the richness of internet commerce and all those companies that make their business on the web. Email is the other internet email killer application. If we can secure email, we can gain more economic benefit, generate more trade, and some of that can pay for the infrastructure that we need to solve this problem. I also left us with the question, why? Why haven't we solved the problem so far? And one of the embarrassments for me coming from the security world is we seem to be really bad at asking this question of ourselves. And that should really embarrass us because as security people, we're very fond of pointing fingers and showing people why their code has holes in it that allows somebody to do, attack it and do bad things. We've had that internet email thing. It's been out there for a quarter century now, insecure, despite the fact that we've got the tools that could solve it. And we don't seem to be asking why. Why hasn't this protocol been deployed before? Why is it important to ask? Well, if you don't ask hard questions, you keep repeating the same mistake again and again. This is a painting of New Harmony uh, in Indiana. It was one of the first utopian communities, uh, the first secular, secular utopian communities in the United States. Um, it was built in the 1825 round. Uh, and the person behind it, Robert Owen, very famous in the UK as both the father of the factory system and also the father of socialism. And as utopian experiments goes, it did a lot of good things. They had the first free public library, they contributed to culture and all sorts of wonderful things, and the community collapsed within two years. You, know, you try something, it fails. No biggie. The catastrophe was not that it failed, but that all the people who followed after failed to realise why it failed, why the centralised planning didn't work, and adapt their plans accordingly. They didn't learn the lessons from other people's failure. And if we don't do that in the security area, well, who's going to do that? But when we're asking these questions, we have to avoid making it into an inquisition. Cryptography is all about puzzles, and this is called a puzzle picture. It's one of the most famous puzzle pictures. It's called, When Did You Last See Your Father? And you can see the English Civil War and the Royalists and the Roundheads, and some really heavy questions are being asked and fingers are being pointed and somebody's going to end up at the sharp end of a pike. We're not doing it we're not looking at this problems for assigning blame. We're only looking at the problems so that we can fix them. But even that is something that a lot of people are unwilling to do because of this lady here, the enthusiasm fairy. The idea comes that if we all just sit around and say how great PGP and SMIME are, then everybody will start using them and we'll soon overcome any problems when we've got the massive users. We've been trying that strategy now for over 15 years. It hasn't worked. It's not going to work if we try a bit longer. The enthusiasm fairy hasn't arrived yet and I don't think she's coming. Another problem that we have is that in the modern web, almost just isn't good enough. It is not enough for a proposal to be 95% right. It has to be 99% right, or maybe it's even 105% right. 
I had a whole box full of smartphones and PDAs until the iPhone came out and none of them was good enough for personal use. Yeah, they were adequate for my business needs but they weren't something that I would sit and read articles on at home. They were purely things that I used when I was travelling on business. And then the iPhone came out and the iPhone was just so good and so easy to use that it was a game changer. That's how good you have to be these days. OK isn't good enough. Good isn't good enough. You have to be excellent. You have to be so good that people look at it and say, hey, that's cool. Another problem we have is we've tried this problem so many times that we have battle fatigue. We have five major attempts to do email security in the past 20 years. And all but two of them failed completely. Only two end-to-end -end security protocols have had limited success. PGP has a user base of some millions of users, but it certainly isn't billions, and the modern internet has two billion users. The same has happened with SMI. We have a limited success, but it isn't ubiquitous, and it's not it's not going to become ubiquitous if we just sit around waiting for the enthusiasm fairy. We have had only one unqualified success. Well, unqualified from the deployment side. And that's the protocol I'm going to be talking about next, Start TLS. Start TLS is ubiquitously deployed. It's in use every day. You're using it without even seeing it. Unfortunately, it doesn't provide a very deep degree of security. Start TLS is named after Transport Layer Security. Uh, transport Layer Security is the e infrastructure that is used to secure the web. It's also known as SSL, which was the original name. When, the, when SSL was handed over to the ITF to become a standard, the name was changed. It became TLS. And so the confusion has been happening ever since. And Start TLS comes with a very simple premise. We have this successful security model for the web, Let's apply it to email. The problem here is that the web and email are different protocols and they have different security properties. The web is what is known as a synchronous protocol. When you're sitting at your computer surfing the web from a web server somewhere, that web server has to be turned on at the same moment that you're surfing, which is fine because you're a human talking to a computer or in some cases you have computers talking to computers. But a human talking to a computer, well, the computer can be always be round there to wait for the human. Email moves from one human to another. And usually the humans are not on the net at the same time. So you have to have a message passing model. When I send an email message, it actually goes through a, a series of mail servers. In the modern internet, you typically have at least two servers. So what will happen is when I send a mail message, I send it, my mail client on my tablet or my PC or my desktop or whatever, that will send it to my outbound mail server. That outbound mail server sits at what's called the edge of my network. The outbound mail server will then forward that mail message to the receiver's mail server. And the receiver's mail server sits at the edge of their network. And then the receiver, when they're ready to pick up their mail, they'll turn on the machine, it'll download the new mail, or they'll connect up with the web mail or whatever, and they'll read their mail. So in the web, we have one connection between the, sen between the user and the service that they're visiting. In the, in the mail system, we actually have typically at least three hops that the message passes over. And if we secure them, the messages using transport layer security, we only protect the message when it's actually in motion. TLS is transport layer security. It only protects data when it's in motion. That's what it's designed to do. It is not designed to protect data when it's at rest. And what that means is 
that when the data is at rest on the outbound mail server and the inbound mail server, it is vulnerable to attack. And this is essentially the type of attack that Snowden was doing on the NSA. He was uh, a network administrator at the NSA. He had the systems access to the machines and the machines had stored data that wasn't encrypted and that he could abstract and use for his own purposes. You may approve of that particular case, but I'm sure that you don't want the administrator of your mail server doing that to you. Now, one of the problems with TLS is, okay, I can choose my mail provider. I can choose Gmail or Yahoo or Comcast or Verizon or whatever. I can, I have some control over my outbound mail server. The receiver of the message chooses the inbound mail server and I have no control over that at all. And that really matters if we're looking at a problem like how does a bank secure um, statements being sent out to customers? How does a doctor secure patient data that's being forwarded over the net? This is a case, these are cases where the sender has to know that they will be received securely. So email over SSL, TLS, is widely supported. It's supported in every mail, major mail server, every major mail client. It really is there as part of the basic email infrastructure. And it's widely used. You're using it every day when you're sending email and you're not even aware that you're doing it. But that's also what makes it limited. You can't say to the Start TLS system, you can't say, this message has to be sent securely or it can't be sent at all. And it only secures the data when it is in motion over the public internet. It doesn't support, it doesn't protect the data when it's at rest, and you've got no guarantee that this is going to be protected in the email, in the network infrastructure of the receiver. This is what's behind the infamous NSA PowerPoint slide, SSL added and removed here. So SSL is good security for what it's designed to do, but it isn't designed to support all the problems we have. S-MIME provides a stronger model, and PGP is similar, but I'll get to that later. S-MIME is designed to support end-to-end -end security. It's designed to be secure even if the sender's outbound mail server and the receiver's inbound mail server are both compromised. A corrupt message, uh, a corrupt sys administrator is not going to be able to read the messages on either server, even if they've got full access to the machine, because the sender is going to encrypt the message under the receiver's public key so that only the receiver can decrypt it and read it. So end-to-end -end security pr protects the data when it's at rest and not just when it's in motion, which is an improvement. Or rather, it is different. You see, the thing is, we're not looking at this as a replacement for SSL. And, and I think my employers might be a bit upset if we were because my employers, Komodo, provide SSL certificates. You see, the thing is that in order for that message to get through the internet securely, well, the internet infrastructure needs to know how to route it. It needs to know where to receive it from and where to forward it to. Which means that the metadata, the routing data, has to be visible to the internet. End-to-end -end security is a data level security solution. If we want to defeat all the ways in which we can be attacked, we need a combination. It's not a question of either or, it's a question of we need both. We need to protect the data in motion, to protect us against metadata analysis and traffic analysis, and we need to protect it at rest so that we can protect it against data level attack. So, SMIME is secure. Well, why not use it? Well, the problem here is really that it's designed for enterprise use and enterprise software tends to be designed to be good enough to make a sale to an enterprise customer, but doesn't need to be great because the guy, and yeah, he usually is a guy, 
The guy who buys it or makes the buying decision usually isn't the person who's going to have to use it every day. So a lot of enterprise software tends to be checklist compliant rather than being designed to be really, really good and iPhone level usability. The way that SMIME is designed, every user has to obtain a digital certificate. And this process is really rather hacky. It, it, it's not that difficult to do, but it's not as easy as it could be. It's good, it's okay, it's not great, it's not excellent. In particular, if you want to configure your email client so that you can do secure email, you have to go to the web browser. And that's a real problem because, you know, your favourite web browser may not be one of the three that the certificate authorities that issue the certificates have tested against. The certificates expire after a year or three years at most, and so you're having to go through this process every time. I seem to be going through the process of applying for certificates almost as often as I'm receiving encrypted mail, to be honest. And the certificates can only really be issued by a certificate authority. That's kind of like built into the assumptions of the system. In order for a certificate to be trustworthy, it has to be issued by people who have a special um, privilege to issue. And that's something that really offends the ideologies of people, which, you know, arguably isn't a problem. You know, I'm not the sort of person who minds it too much about people get about getting too bent out of shape about their ideology. But the people who tend to get upset about this are exactly the people who know most about crypto and whose enthusiasm we need to sell it to the general public. Another problem with SMIME is the sender needs to decide to use encryption. They have to click the encrypt button every time they send an email message. Well, okay, not quite. There are some mail clients that allow you to say, send my messages encrypted whenever possible. So why don't those really work? Well, okay, we're, we're looking at this presentation on my main machine, which I use for my programming and for everyday use. I also have a second desktop here that is my, uh, win that I use when I'm doing some work on Macs. And I have a phone that I read my email on as well. And I have a tablet and I have a laptop. And well, actually I have a second laptop because uh, when you travel as much as I do, uh, you really want a small laptop. And then I have a few of these things which are uh, machines that I have, that these are burners uh, that I want, that I use when I've got secure documents that I don't want to be on my machines that might be compromised. So I have eight machines here on which I receive email. And I don't configure every single one of them to receive my encrypted email. Well, I don't do it at the moment because it's too much effort. I'd have to import, export and import private keys everywhere. It's just too much hassle. If we're going to have a system that people can use, it has to fit with the way that people use the internet today. And today, people want to be able to read their email on multiple devices. Okay, so much for SMIME, well, why not open PGP? Because that's also an ITF standard. And, you know, one of the frustrations I have here is that the SMIME and PGP working groups used to take place at the ITF side by side. So we'd go to the SMIME one, and then a few moments later, and when that ended, we'd go into talk about PGP. You know, we were devising, developing two separate, incompatible email standards at the same time, in the same organisation. Well, OpenPGP does address the ideology issue and the personal control issue that SMI fails on. It, it has this web of trust in place of certificates. I'm not going to go into it here because it takes quite a long time to explain. In fact, that's one of the problems with PGP. 
I'll explain that in part four when we're looking at trust models and how to move beyond the S-MIME and PGP problems. One of the biggest drawbacks with OpenPGP today is that it requires a plugin to work. Plugins are really great for experimenting and for prototyping work. They're really lousy as deployment because you have to maintain the plugin along with the application. And sometimes you find that the person who was maintaining the plugin stops maintaining it and then you can't upgrade your product, your, your mail client anymore. Uh, this happened to me with web browsers. I decided a while back that I would use the Google toolbar because that allowed me to share my bookmarks across all the web browsers I use. And because I do web development, you know, I check stuff out on Internet Explorer, I check it out on Firefox, I check it out on Opera. You know, so having one toolbar that allowed me to share all my bookmarks was really great. Until I moved to Chrome. And Chrome doesn't support, Chrome, the Google browser, doesn't support the Google bookmarks. Getting a bit lame now after six years. So where are we? Well, we're in a standards war. You know, this is like VHS versus Betamax again. It's, and, but unlike that one, which was ended after a fairly short time, this one's been going on now for 20 years because each side has got a partial victory. The S9 folk point to the fact that they have ubiquitous deploy deployment. Almost every email client in widespread use today supports S9 as native functionality and it's designed to meet enterprise needs. So S-MIME has won it on the deployment front. They have their code out there, they've won. PGP, on the other hand, has the dominant mind share. When people talk about email, they talk, when people talk about email security, most times they're talking about PGP. And this is largely thanks to the effective advertising that Louis Free at the FBI gave to PGP during the crypto wars. PGP has dominant mindshare, it's designed to meet individual needs, but it doesn't have the deployment base. So this has been a stalemate now for 20 years and it's not going to be solved just by waiting for one side or the other to win. The only way that we can end this standards war is to put a new proposal on the table that is better than both. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to have usability and we need to have a new trust model. For usability, we need to make secure mail as easy to use as regular mail. It's got to be what I call frictionless. One click to send an email is not good enough. It has to be no clicks at all, no additional effort. And we have to support the way that modern email users use email, which is on multiple devices. And we have to have a new trust model. We need to be able to support enterprise and individual users in one coherent scheme, rather than having two disjoint schemes with separate infrastructure, separate formats for each. And certificate authorities need to become optional enablers, not gatekeepers. There's no role for gatekeepers in providing internet privacy. What I'd like people to do is to think, of, instead of thinking about CAs as a gatekeeper, think of those as a cryptographic advisors. Because some people can manage their security. Some people know crypto very well, and those are usually the people who are telling people, use PGP, secure your system, do this, do that, and then laughing at them when they don't. But most people prefer to have help. They are not crypto specialists. They want some help. When my people are selling certificates, the most frequent conversation in my sales rooms is not buy this, buy that, buy that. It's okay, explain to me what your server's doing now. You know, let me walk through the system. You know, help, let me help you debug this problem that has come up. And you know, if you do that once, uh, people keep coming back to you again and again because you know, if you see this stuff every day, you can do it really quickly. Doing it once a year is harder. So SMIME has this model where everybody is forced to seek help. 
whereas OpenPGP has a model that doesn't have a role for any helper at all. S-Mine is nanny state crypto and OpenPGP is a Galtian model in which nobody can get any help at all. Help should always be available, but it needs to be an option, not a requirement. But it's not just about fixing the problems. One of the, problem, one of the biggest issues that I have when people are saying, well, I can solve this crypto problem, is they come up with a solution that solves the one problem that they see in the existing infrastructure, but they fail to solve all the, the other problems that the existing infrastructure solves, but their new proposal won't. And you know, we didn't get to where we are because people didn't have good ideas and people didn't see this other way of doing things in most cases. Quite often people are proposing a system that was proposed and rejected because there was some other constraint that people found to be more important. Doesn't mean that we can't revisit old constraints, but we do have to understand they exist, we do have to acknowledge them. So when we're looking at new proposal, we have to meet all the use cases of the old. We've got to be able to support all the users, all the diverse platforms, all the multiple device issues, all of that has to be solved. We have to provide an administration model which is compatible with the administration model for existing email. And if we are proposing anything that requires infrastructure, we need to have a business model that supports it. Open source software works really well for one reason. The marginal cost of providing open source software is essentially zero. All you need to do is to have a website where people can download the application from, and that's it. Providing open source services is different. If you have a service like a dating service or Facebook or whatever, and that requires people and that requires support and machines, well, the marginal cost of supporting that goes up with each individual user. You know, Facebook's cost of doing business goes up every time somebody opens an account. Facebook couldn't possibly operate if they didn't have some way of turning those costs into revenues. Having infrastructure is not a showstopper, but anybody who proposes infrastructure has to have a business model to support it. Webmail is also an issue. Now, today, something between 30 and 50% of all mail is webmail. Now, I'm not going to talk about that in this particular talk because solving webmail is something that requires changes to other parts of the internet in infrastructure. We'll need to change HTML in order to support good security in webmail. But we do have to acknowledge the fact that some people are going to use the web to read their email. And finally, yes, too much security can be a problem. Oh, yeah, that might come as a surprise. What do I mean by too much security? Well, the thing is that security is not an unconditional good. When you have security, that means that you're putting some constraints on the system and stopping it doing some things. And sometimes those are the things that you want to do. If you're today, when you're using email, you have to be aware of the fact that there are these people sending spam who are trying to attack you. And one of the big, one of the most frequent objections I've had to this presentation when I begin giving it in private is, oh, it won't work, spam, end to end. You know, content filters won't be able to work. Well, I'll come to why that's not a problem in a moment. The problem that they see there is that if we have secure email end to end, then these filters in the middle won't be able to see the content and won't be able to work. A lot of webmail is supported by advertising. How is the provider going to preserve their business model? How are they going to hook in the advertisements? And then there are regulated environments when end to end email cannot be deployed by law. This happens very frequently in brokerages. Uh, it's certainly the case in the US, it's the case in many other countries as well. If you have a trader who's sitting at their trading desk, most governments believe that the public interest 
in making sure that that trader is not engaged in insider trading is trumps that individual's right to privacy. Yeah. I have a right to privacy in my private life. I don't have the same right to privacy when I am at work or when I am uh, handling classified data. Now, that doesn't mean I have no rights or that my employers should be able to see all my personal information, but it does mean that there are cases in which my personal rights may not carry through to my employment. Too much security can be a real problem, but fortunately it has a very easy solution. If, you, if your problem is too much security, your solution is to have less. If you can't support the full end-to-end -end security model, then don't. Go back to the end-to-edge -to -edge solution. Have a key for your receiver's inbound email. Decrypt the messages there. Do whatever you need. Do your archiving for compliance. Do your spam content filtering. Whatever you need to do there. And then re-encrypt it before handing it over to the receiver. And potentially this could be a device that is locked down and trustworthy and protected against um, malfeasance by the uh, administrators. But, and, and this is actually some, a model that is supported today in many SMIM commercial products and many PGP commercial products. But the problem is that because it's not a, an approach that is anticipated in the design of the protocol, it's kind of like a hack. It's not something that is that the it's something that is possible, but it isn't something that the protocol is designed to make easy. In fact, it's something that the protocol designers intended to make very hard. If we're going to make email, what we've got to do here is to make ubiquitous email security the priority, rather than one particular approach. We have to recognise that some people can't have the full end-to-end -end security model. But in the traditional model, we've got it's all or nothing. Either all your mail is going to be sent end-to-end -end, or all of it is going to be end-to-edge. -end. We don't need to force that type of choice on the end user. Most users are going to want to have want to divide their email into categories. They may have one category of email that they want to go through the content filter because it's just bulk mail from people they don't know and they don't particularly care about. They have another bucket of email that they want to be able to read on all their devices and they want to be encrypted end to end because it's personal and they don't want anybody else seeing. But for people like me, they, you know, we would have a third category in that I don't want the uh, messages that I'm reading on this device to be readable on any of my other devices. I have eight machines that I read email on. I don't want to have, I don't want my most private information to be vulnerable on all eight of those devices. I want to have it only vulnerable on the one device that I have for that purpose and that I replace frequently. So in the traditional model, it's all or nothing and one size fits all. We have an opportunity here to give people more flexibility and choose precisely the degree of security that they need for particular applications. So that's the problem space as I see it. We can now get on to the business of finding solutions. And I've divided the solution space and the remaining presentations into two. In part three, I'm going to be describing what I call plumbing, and in part four, I'm going to be describing what I call research. The reason that I make a distinction between the two is that there are some parts of the solution that are potentially shareable by everybody else who's trying to solve this solution. I want to find a solution to this problem. I don't insist that it be my solution that is used. And so when I'm looking at the problem, I want to divide things up so that instead of having a repeat of the mistake that we made with PGP and SMIME, where your choice of trust model forced you into a choice between formats, I want to have one format 
one set of data flows that can be shared by multiple trust models. So I'm going to take the hard part of the problem, the research problem, and I'm going to separate that out into a part four. And I'm going to look at the plumbing, which is the infrastructure, which is the part we can share in part three. And the objective here is that we want to have as many people working on this problem in as many different ways as possible. The plumbing is something that by its very nature we need to have that implemented on many different machines and in many different applications. We need to be able to enable crypt crypto in every mail client that's out there. We need Outlook, we need Apple Mail, we need Thunderbird, we need the Google Mail on Android. There's a lot of coding to be done there and that coding can be done potentially by one group of people and then that effort can be shared by a diverse research community that are looking at the trust question in different and exciting ways. The trust problem is not going to be solved in one go. I think that we can make a considerable advance, but we're not going to have a one-size-fits-all now and forever solution. That's something that we will continue to work on and need to revise our approach as the deployment expands. The trust model that's suitable for a million people may be different from the one that's suitable for 10 million, for 100 million, for a billion and so on. We need to be able to look at how well we're doing and change our approach going forward. So we've got two parts of the solution space, the plumbing, which comes next, and the research that we'll see in part three. Research what we'll see in part four. So that's, that's the end of this presentation. Uh, before I go, if you want this, uh, if you want more presentations like this, if you want to have secure email, then uh, please um, hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. The more people who are watching these videos, the more people who are taking note of crypto, the greater the message we send to Microsoft and Google and Apple and all the other parties that can help deploy a solution that people really do want to have secure mail, they really want to have their privacy protected online. So please click the like button and please stay tuned for part three. Thank you very much.